hearing FCC family? Yeah. Nothing like hearing joyful, joyful from that organ? Welcome to our warm and beautiful sanctuary. Please join me in our opening sentences. This is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. All right, as we get started, just want to say a special thank you to our worship team, our director of music, Julie Morgan, our accompanist, David Salyers, the fantastic FCC Choir, our ushers who make it all happen, Reverend Heather, Saya, Susan, and Stella. Please give them a round of applause. And the director of our children's ministry, a woman who needs no introduction, the Reverend Karma Cloud. And the young man that brings our service to the world, the one and the only Matthew McDonald. And the folks that set up to we'll make sure all of our audio is working and in place. Michael Harney, Jay Richardson, and Steve Kataya. We are so grateful that you all are here on this Communion Sunday. Uh, we ask that you please take a second to register with us by just turning to the back of your bulletin and using the QR code, and we especially encourage first-time visitors to do this, as we would love to send you a note of welcome and greeting during the week. Also, want to thank everyone for following our COVID protocols, and you'll see uh, folks are seated in every other pew, and we ask that you please keep on your mask throughout the service. And now, Without any further delay, let's have church. this week. 
If this is, in fact, your first time with us or it's been a long time since you've been with us, we welcome you to this space. We'd like you to take a look at the pews around you and the beautiful faces therein, for the members and friends of this church are truly the ministers of this church. So if you have a question or a need that arises during worship, please just reach out to someone nearby or to one of our ushers. We are all here to serve one another. Friends, we continue to go deeper into the season of the year that the church calls ordinary time where we are invited to experience God in the everyday wonders that surround us. We see it in the change of the angle of the light, the change of the seasons in the leaves of the trees, the shortening days, the frost on the lawn in the morning. And so at this time of worship, we mark that change as well, and we shift our priorities from the week and recognize that we are in a sacred Sabbath time where the expression of God is all around us. We simply need to pay attention. And so we lay down our stresses and our burdens and our distractions, and we open our hearts to God, for we are seekers. Not for answers, but for wisdom. Not for doctrine, but for a way of life, inspired by the radical love of Jesus the Christ. And so, in the abiding presence of God, let us be together in a spirit of sacred and holy worship. Please join me in our call to worship. You are welcome in this place where God meets us in love. We gather to love God with all we have and all we are. You are welcome in this place where God loves us as children. We gather to learn to love ourselves as deeply as God loves us. Welcome to this place where God invites us the table of love and grace. We gather to be sent forth to love others as deeply as we love God and ourselves. May our worship shape us, inspire us, and invite us to God's heart and command in the world. Amen. <laughs> Coming back up, arms open wide, and bringing it in 
for an FCC hug. Amen, amen. And last time, first few rows, please face the back few rows and take in all these amazing people that are gathered in this place. Hands together, prayer position. The God in me greets the God in you, bending down. Coming back up, arms open wide, and then bring it in for an FCC hug. Amen, amen.
beautiful arches and a little bit of the stained glass. But you know what my favorite thing to come back to? Is your eyes. All of you. So today, let's, let's close our eyes again and give thanks, because now maybe you can see, when you close your eyes, you can see that beautiful sanctuary. You can see the labyrinth. You can see the vaulted ceilings and the banners and the communion table. Thank you, dear God, for preserving this sanctuary through this pandemic, through the floods, <laughs> through the weather, preserving this beautiful, sacred space for us to return to and to rejoice in. May we continue to care for each other and keep our faith alive, just as we did through YouTube, through online, through Facebook, through outdoors, and back within, just like this labyrinth teaches us. The path will bring us in. We go out and in and out and in. Thank you, God, for surrounding us with your love the love that is in these walls, the love of years past, of hands and hearts who have gathered here for 150 years. May that continue forevermore. Amen. you are closer to us than our very breath. And so we turn our hearts in loving awareness to your presence within and around us. As we hold in our prayers this morning so many who are in need of spiritual, physical, or emotional healing. We lift up all those we know and love who are contending with a cancer diagnosis and with the struggles of chemotherapy. We especially pray for John, Vivian, Michelle, Lori, and Pam. God in your mercy. We pray for Maybeth as she recovers from a broken hip, for Babs as she continues to recuperate in a nursing home, and for, for Clarissa as she heals after a fall. Hold all in your protective and healing grace. God in your mercy. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for Asha for her recovery and healing from an illness that she is now out of the ICU. God in your mercy. We offer prayers of healing and comfort for Sal as he recovers from knee surgery. God in your mercy. And we pray for all who are grieving, who are mourning the loss of a loved one or a relationship. We especially lift up Dillis. And we also pray for Libby and her husband as they mourn the death of their young son, Henry. God, in your mercy. Hear our we pray for all among us who are struggling with financial anxiety, lack of employment, or any insecurity regarding housing or income. Help us, O oh God, to find opportunity and support and to know that we are held in our struggles. God, in your mercy. Hear our Holy One, Whenever two or more are gathered in your name, you are there. And so you are here, right here, healing us, inspiring us, and gently redirecting us to see the world as you do and to love it with your love. And so in this time of prayer, we are invited to say aloud, to speak aloud, any joys or concerns that we hold this day. And we hold them and we ask God in your mercy. Hear our prayer.
Hear us now as one family of faith, as we share aloud the prayer that Jesus, your Son, and our brother taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. so grateful for all of the generosity that's within this congregation. The youth group that is leading our worship this morning, our ushers, our amazing choir, we are part of such a giving community. And one of the things that sustains us is our financial contributions. So at this time, we just have a gentle reminder that there are several ways that we can give. You can give through the FCC giving page. You can use the VanCo mobile app or you can text your gift. All details are in your bulletin. The ushers will be coming around after our stewardship speaker. And once again, thank you so much for your generosity. As a congregational church, we have the freedom to live out the gospel message as we choose and the responsibility of supporting the work of our congregation. And that includes our financial support as well. Each fall, we draw particular attention to the important spiritual discipline of generosity as we encourage and inspire one another to give to FCC so that our church can grow and thrive. We do this by highlighting the story of a few folks in our congregation who take an active role in supporting our church. One of the strengths of our community is that we have so many folks who give in so many different ways. And this morning, we are very excited to welcome Joanne to share our stewardship message. Please give her a big round of applause. transfixed. I stood there on the sidewalk and just looked. 
And after a while, I said, you know, Joanne, to myself, maybe it's time you let the past be the past and move forward. So I sucked it up and came to church the following Sunday. <laughs> and I'm on that front step, standing there. One side saying, go in, the other one saying, run away, go away. And this was real. I, I'm, I'm making it sound like a joke, but in fact, it was a real battle to get in through that front door, which I finally did. And then I found out, to my consternation, it was Communion Sunday, besides everything else. And so that just added a level of stress in my brain. But you know, what was really good for me to see and witness was that as I watched people come down for Communion, which like we used to do, actually come down and take, and sorry, we can't do that yet, but soon, hopefully. I watched them, they were coming down, people were talking with one another. They were laughing, they were smiling, there were children, there were older people, there were younger people. And I realized people were happy to be here. This was something new to my experience. I had never witnessed that before. And I thought, you know what, maybe I'll come back next week, see how it goes. And now here I am, three years later, hitting you up for money. <laughs> see how that goes. <laughs> You know, when I was thinking about doing this talk, I had to think, well, why do I keep coming back to this church? And I challenge you to think about the same thing. Like, really think about it. Maybe not right this second, but, you know, in a while. Because what came to my mind first was the list of activities you can do here. You, can, you know from looking at the bulletin, looking at online, you can be busy just running back and forth to this church with the book club and the lab, you can come and walk the labyrinth, you can join the choir, you can uh, go to underground church, you can do spiritual studies, and there's probably more that I can't remember off the top of my head. But then I was thinking, you know, there's more to that. There's something that runs underneath it, or through it, or around it, or something. And for me, what I realized that was, was my need for spiritual nourishment. I needed to come someplace where that part of my soul would be fed. And I believe this place is it. And I believe each one of you who comes regularly, I see the same faces week after week. Well, maybe not the same, but similar. <laughs> who come. And for some reason, and I believe that's the reason, the, 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 the deep reason why you show up. And when we are all of us gathered here together, us plus our ancestors who created this space, plus our own personal ancestors who, like it or not for me, instilled in me this understanding of religion, we're all here and then guided by this architecture, by the music, by the words that are spoken or read, we come together and are filled and expanded and inspired. You know, when we walk out, we're the same people, really. But that God inside us, that little, no, not little, that unseen ephemeral presence in us and surrounding us has been nurtured. It's not something we talk about much, well, really ever in our modern life. But for me, it's important. And frankly, I've become a junkie. You know, I can't stay away. This is something that's important for me. And yes, I contribute. I contribute financially. And I'm going to ask you to do the same. And I realize many of you do that already, but maybe just a little bit more. Maybe you can add a little bit to that monthly donation. Kathleen, a couple of weeks ago, stood up here and said how we're not meeting monthly expenses. I'm like, oh my goodness. That got my attention. We start not meeting monthly expenses, that just ramps up over time. And you never, it's like a credit card debt. You never, you never get out of it. So we need to, um, we need to do it, guys. I want FCC to grow and to become more, not just float along, head of water, treading water. But eventually you're gonna tire, and you're gonna get tired, and you're gonna sink. So, I hope you will contribute if you are able. I totally realize not everyone has the wherewithal to do this. Every little bit counts. 
So I'm asking you to contribute. It benefits all of us. So thank you. Now we will hear a brief word from our stewardship chair, Kathleen.
One of those arrested was a leader of the United Church of Christ's Commission for Racial Justice, Dr. Benjamin Chavis Jr., who would go on to publish the first nationwide study on environmental racism five years later. The church's groundbreaking Toxic Waste and Race in the United States report found that race was the most important predictor of proximity to hazardous waste facilities in America, and that three out of five black and Latinx Americans lived in communities with toxic sites. Forty years later, government data still show that black people are 1.5 times more likely to breathe polluted air and drink unsafe water than the overall population. So now it's our turn to step up. Uh, there is a local event that, that you probably know of uh, that, that's happening this coming Wednesday uh, in Newark. Uh, it's, it's sponsored by the, um, let's see, the, the Newark uh, Environmental, um, let's see, what, um, the Ironbound Community Corporation, uh, as well as, as 350.org and other organizations uh, in Power, New Jersey, which is a coalition of 60 environmental groups in New Jersey. It's a protest rally focusing on environmental racism that's happening November 10th, 3.30 p.m. at the Sharp James Kenneth Gibson Rec Center at 226 Rome Street. Talk to me later if you'd like the address in Newark. And here's some background written by the uh, Ironbound Community Corporation, which of course is just down the road. Uh, the Ironbound Community in Newark is one of the most polluted, overburdened communities in the country. Governor Murphy's uh, New Jersey Department of, protect, of environmental protection has yet to implement a groundbreaking environmental justice law, but final rules to make it operational aren't expected until sometime in 2022. In the meantime, polluters are trying to sneak in their permit applications before the new rules go into effect, including two new polluting projects proposed in the Iron Bank. So the first project is the Ares project, which is a massive sludge facility proposed by Ares Corporation that involves transport of 430 tons of human waste via trucks, uh, hundreds of trucks daily. The facility would operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, would introduce more sludge trucks, noxic odors, to noxious odors, and potential for toxic exposures in an area that already has too much pollution. The plant would emit over 285,000 pounds per year of air pollutants, including particulate matter, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, and more. And then the second project uh, is, uh, is being proposed by the Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission. The PBSC is proposing to build a new fracked gas power plant. The power plant is part of a resiliency project to allow their existing facility to continue processing wastewater in times when the commercial electricity grid is down. It would increase the pollution burden in the Ironbound community, which already suffers from decades of environmental racism. So if you want more information about that, I know John has sent some information out, but there's more. It's, a, it's important for us to, to look at local projects because the more that we build infrastructure, fossil fuel infrastructure, that will last for decades, the slower we will be to, to fight the climate crisis. Uh, also, just uh, an, an announcement that just down the street on Saturday, November 20th at 10 o'clock, uh, B'nai Keshet Congregation is holding an environmental Shabbat worship service at 10 a.m. Uh, and we're all welcome. This is on November 20th. Reverend Fletcher Harper of greenfaith.org will be preaching. It'll be a meaningful, prayerful expression of hope for a just climate transition to a sustainable environment and vibrant ecosystem. One last uh, announcement is that there is a protest, a week of protest coming up starting November 30th uh, against the uh, proposed liquefied natural gas export terminal in Gibbstown, New Jersey. Uh, this project uh, includes hundreds and hundreds of trucks filled with, with uh, liquefied natural gas that will be driving not only through Pennsylvania but also through New Jersey uh, and then ordered on onto ships. This is all extremely volatile and extremely dangerous, and it also includes, um, this is all fracked gas, and so it, it, it encourages the development of more fracked gas. Um, the safety and environmental health of millions hangs in the balance, um, and so they have a virtual rally on November 30th to kick off this week. So we'll get the, more of this information out to you. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, please let, let, let me know. In Laudato Si, uh, the Pope's encyclical about the environment, he urges Christians to consider the long-term effects of our actions which impact the future well-being of the human species, all living things, and our planet itself. He says, the notion of the common good extends to future generations. Once we start thinking about the kind of world we're leaving to future generations, we look at things differently. We realize the world is a gift which we have freely received. 
and we must share and protect for others. Thank you, and God bless. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Here we are, back inside of our beautiful sanctuary. Is there anything that you have noticed today that you never saw before? As you take it all in, what do you appreciate the most? There is a satellite image of our church online. Type in First Congregational Church Montclair into Google Maps, and you will see this church spanning one city block along South Fullerton Avenue from the Crescent to Plymouth Street. This is the place where we have gathered since the 1870s. Zoom in a little bit closer, and you'll see our church building as it stands today. Zoom in a little bit more, and you'll see on our front lawn these perfectly drawn white circles. <laughs> in perfectly aligned rows. What will future generations think of this image? Were these alien crop circles? Oh, I know what these are. Aren't those the circles from that global pandemic in the 2020s? We will never forget this period in our lives. Meeting outside the walls of this building for the last 20 months has taught us about ourselves, informed our relationships with each other, and helped us to appreciate the generous connective power of this community. We sat under the large tree and enjoyed the shade that it provided from the hot summer sun. We listened to the liturgy in harmony with the motorcycles as they roared by, and all of those planes that flew overhead. We watched our neighbors stop and listen and appreciate our choir's beautiful music. We were reminded that this congregation thrives when we connect with one another, whether we are inside of a building or not that when we connect and give generously of ourselves, we can reach out and have a positive impact on the world around us. And now, as vaccination rates rise 
and the temperature drops, we appreciate just how blessed we are to have this shelter to return to. Did you know that FCC was founded by abolitionists? From the beginning, this church was dedicated to contributing outside the walls of the building. FCC founded Mountainside Hospital, the high school, and a children's home. FCC was a force in the Montclair community. Then, in 1914, one year into World War I, on March 20th, the entire town was startled by whistles and sirens. Fire engines tore through the streets. The weather was cold for March. There was still snow on the ground, and yet all the townspeople rushed outdoors to determine the location of the fire. Oh no, they yelled one to another. It's the first congregational church. And they ran, following the fire engines on foot. It seemed as if all of Montclair had come to watch the firefighters furiously battle the flames that leapt up the tall spire. The fire had started from crossed wires behind the organ and was already blazing by the time that it was discovered. Despite all of the Herculean efforts, it was a hopeless endeavor, and they couldn't save the building. Members of the congregation and all their neighbors watched the beloved church go up in flames. And as the story goes, while the old church still lay smoldering, embers still hot and smoking, congregants began to meet and discuss how the new building would look, what would be the new church edifice. There was a determined hope in the midst of all of that chaos. Church members hired Bertram Goodhue, an eccentric architect who from an early age loved all things medieval. Does that surprise anyone? He was a leader in the Gothic Revival movement who had designed Rockefeller Chapel in Chicago, the grounds at West Point, and the building for the National Academy of the Sciences. He worked quickly and efficiently, and along with 200 workers, they built this magnificent church in only two years. The choices that were made were inspired by the actively engaged members of the community. They insisted that hospitality was a central value that needed to be expressed in the design. And so, the narthex, which is just a churchy word for a lobby that you all need to refer, which in most churches is just a dark space through which people pass, was ingeniously constructed to allow light in so that it could serve as a welcoming space. Congregants wanted to acknowledge that this church was a place for healing, and so it was decided that this north transept window would depict the Bible scene of the healing of Jairus' daughter by Jesus. And this was made possible by a gift from Mr. and Mrs. Adams, who had recently lost their daughter, Carolyn. Young members in the congregation wanted to express their active involvement in the church, and so they raised all of the money to build this pulpit. There was a collective decision to use materials in the construction that would reduce the risk of fire, and so limestone, granite, tile were used in the walls and the vaulted ceilings. Coming together to create in the midst of upheaval, members became more connected to one another, and they realized their responsibility to the larger community. They made this a time of transition that marked a new chapter in the life of the church. Members of the congregation took a vote and made a huge change. 
they voted to do away with the rented pews. From this point forward, the pews were free, open and available to anyone, whether they had money or not. On Easter Sunday, April 23rd, 1916, hundreds of members of the congregation filed in through our big front doors for the first ever service held in this building. They connected with God and each other, and they celebrated the resurrection. Among them was a 30-year-old woman named Ann Coe Mitchell, who had been baptized in 1886 in the old church building. Now, after graduating from Smith College and a famous writer, she found a pew, sat down, and gazed around in awe. Then she took out her pen and began to write this poem. On first entering our new temple, I step within and all my longing soul, at sigh of beauty suddenly revealed, grows warm within me while I stand and kneel. My spirit to the wonder of the whole, the vaulted roof of reaches like a prayer, the carving breathes a blessing in this place. While like some holy music fill in space, the windows flame with story meanings fair. One hundred years ago, members of a community watched their sacred space go up in flames. In the midst of that terrible catastrophe, relationships deepened, new friendships were born, creativity unleashed, actions were taken. They fixed what was broken, and they created what came next, this beautiful shelter in the storm. Today, we return to our beautiful building, and we thank God that this church, now over a hundred years old, still stands. Like all buildings, this one calls for our attention. When there is heavy rain, water pours in by the stairs off of the narthex. With Hurricane Ida, we had three feet of water in our sub-basement, creating around $25,000 worth of damage to our boiler. We've had to repair our boiler to ensure that we have heat and hot water and to keep our pipes from freezing during the winter months. This is our house. Like any house that we call home, it requires our ongoing tending and care. Now I realized something while I was living and working in Belize. I noticed that in the Maya villages, they create their roofs out of palm branches, impermanent roofs, which it would inevitably fall down in the course of the year. Why, I wondered, did they use, why, I wondered, didn't they use tin or inexpensive, more durable materials that were available? Why did they choose to build thatch roofs out of natural materials? But as the months wore on, I came to better understand this aspect of the culture. I realized that thatch roofs, which would need to be remade and renewed, actually fueled cohesion between the people. No one person could build the roof alone. Creating a new roof required neighbors coming together, helping one another to begin a new chapter, an initiation that requires the community to take part. A reminder that everything in life needs to be maintained. Here we are. This is our new beginning. We have the opportunity to come together to mend what is broken and to express who we are through our sacred space. This house is our home. 
May it be so. Amen.
capable of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Jesus identified himself. It is the table of communion with the earth in which Christ became incarnate. Against all the rules and expectations of his time, Jesus crossed the boundary and invited everyone to share in the abundance of God. So join us in this moment of communion, those who would have much faith and those who would like to have more, those who have been here often and those who have not been for a long time, those who have tried to follow Jesus and those who have fallen short. Come, it is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Please join me in our great thanksgiving. God is with you. Open your hearts. Let us give thanks to the giver of all gifts. My friends, this is a story which belongs to all of us, and so I invite you to join me in telling it anew. I will say a line, and I invite you to repeat the line back to me. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup. In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks to God, he gave it to them, saying, And after giving thanks to God, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we eat this bread and drink this cup. We proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ will come again. As the members of the church are truly the ministers of the church, I invite everyone to now raise your hand in a sign of blessing so that we may consecrate the elements together. Companion in Christ, as we break this bread of fragile life, remind us that our breaking down becomes our breaking through. As we eat this living bread and drink the new cup of resurrection, let us celebrate the cosmic Christ, our liberator and sustainer who transforms, renews, and empowers us to serve the world. Breathe your spirit upon us and upon these simple elements, that they may be heaven's food and drink for us, renewing, sustaining, and making us whole, that we may be your body here on earth, loving and caring for the world. For it is through the broken bread that we participate in the body of Christ, and it is through the cup of blessing that we participate in the new life which Christ brings. Amen. You may lower your hands. Thank you. Look, the bread of heaven is broken for the life of the world, the gifts of God for all people of God. In remembrance of the extravagant hospitality of Jesus, our communion table is an open table. That means all, everyone present here is welcome, including people of all faiths and children of all ages. No doubt is too strong, no faith too weak to come to the feast of God. We now invite our youth uh, helpers, Debian and Anna, to come forward. While we are still maintaining our COVID protocol, we will be uh, distributing communion packs to you. Reverend John, myself, Debian, and Anna will come down the center aisle and stop at the pew. We will uh, pass a basket. Please take a package out of the basket and continue to pass it to your neighbor and then bring it all the way back to the center. If you require a gluten-free bread option, they are in the bags with the blue tape. We ask that you do not consume your communion elements right away, but rather wait till everyone has received them so we can share this sacrament together. Come, let us share the feast that God sets before us.
Then when my husband got so terribly ill and I needed to, to work much from home, uh, similarly, John stepped into pastoral leadership in ways that really didn't surprise any of us, but we are tremendously grateful for it. And so what has emerged out of that experience is a new paradigm for worship leadership that we are working through the process with. We wanted to share it with you today. So very briefly, we are going to be losing the hierarchical titles of senior minister and associate pastor, associate minister. And we are proposing a more collaborative model that really does speak to how we have always done things here in this church. One that will uh, invite each of us to focus on some key areas as lead pastors. So my new pa title would be lead pastor for worship and congregational transformation. My primary focuses, will, foci will be on worship uh, planning, leadership. I will be preaching three times a month, working with our outrageously talented team as we plan liturgical services throughout the year. Uh, new member cultivation, uh, working with bringing folks into the life of this church, working with baptismal families as they have their children baptized. Also creating opportunities for congregational care, relationship building, and development. Reverend John's new title will be Lead Pastor for Spiritual Formation and Community Development. And his primary areas will focus on youth and family ministry, social justice outreach, strengthening our stewardship and management systems within the church. And Ann and I have been a team for eight years and have gotten into some good trouble together. Much <laughs> more to come. Have made, <laughs> have made um, just wonderful memories with the whole congregation, and it's just been such a blessing to be a part of this congregation and to learn so much under Reverend Ann's leadership. Uh, since we've been working collaboratively for so long, we will continue to work collaboratively, collaboratively in so many areas of the church, including pastoral care. We will both be around for pastoral care. We will both be leading adults and spiritual education. Uh, we will, along with our volunteer communications director, Sal Jensen, we will be working on the communications as a team. We will both witness to social justice in our wider community. And since it's very much a central value of our congregation, we will both be engaged in our interfaith work. And both of us will advise and counsel the executive committee as they set the administrative priorities for our community. So we're currently working on the bylaws and they are going to be revised to reflect this change. And we're working through the process with our executive committee uh, and then our council, our wider council to approve them. Um, but we'll be sending out an email to the entire congregation this week. John and I are gonna make one of our patented fireside chat videos. <laughs> so stay, stay, stay tuned for that. We know you can't wait for that. Um, and, and, and we will uh, look to be having maybe a Zoom question and answer session if people have more questions about what this shift to what this new paradigm is about. But most importantly, we're going to be voting on this change at the congregational meeting after worship on November 21st. So please be sure to be there um, along along with all the rest of our members so that we can make this change official. And just again, so much gratitude to Reverend John for the partner that he is and will be and just the ways that we have really come together to lead this church through some very challenging and rewarding times. Right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> so let us close, my friends, with a reading of our closing commission. And I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would as you are able. For the Spirit of God is upon us. God has anointed us to bear the news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to open the prisons of those who are bound. Let us go forth in the name of Christ to bring peace into broken relationships, healing to alienated persons, and justice into oppressive structures. Amen. Friends, our worship has ended, but our service has just begun. Let us remember that we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us, and now it is time for all of us to make our mark 
in the next chapter of our amazing FCC history. And let us remember that we never go it alone, for we go with the love of God, the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit, and the ever-present friendship and companionship of Jesus. Amen.